All right, David, thanks so much for, uh, you know, uh, jumping on the Skype call with me. Um, you know, it's uh, going to be so great for like some of the viewers here to sort of see, you know, what it is from a composer angle and stuff like that and sort of how, uh, you know, it, how, how the world in, in licensing and composing worked for you. Um, and so uh, first off, I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, how did you get your start? So, you know, going way back, like when you were a kid, uh, how did you get into music, you know, like before all this other stuff happened? I mean, was it the kind of thing where you uh, had a very uh, great affinity to music? Did you fall into it later? Was your family musical or how did that work? Okay, well, so um, that is going back a ways. My grandfather and my father were both amateur musicians. Um, I, they both played the piano and sang and played both classical music and what they called popular music. Yeah. Um, so I grew up hearing, you know, my father's repertoire. He played some Chopin, he played some Bach, he played some Beethoven, and he also played a ton of Tin Pan Alley stuff. So I heard all of that uh, from a pretty young age. Um, and then um, I learned the violin in school. They had a you know, school program. It was one of the first instruments you could start. So that's what I started with. I never really liked it that much, and I wasn't that good at it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then um, I actually got into really being interested in playing music. I went to a, a hippie summer camp when I was 11, and I learned to play a little bit of claw hammer banjo. Yeah. Then I came home uh, after four weeks of that, and my sister had just gotten just gotten into the Beatles, and so that freaked me out. You know, she played me a couple of records, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> you're not that old." <laughs> I well, you know, she had a, she had a, a best friend who's who had older siblings who were hippies. So I, you know, that's how we that's how we got to the Beatles. Got it. Uh, not that young either. Um, <laughs> so my parents were like, "Well, do you want to?" You know, as I, as I came home saying, "Well, I want to learn the banjo," and my parents were like, "Maybe the guitar would be a little more like, you know, universal." You know, so and so. Between hearing the records and the fact that they could borrow a guitar from a neighbor, I was like, "Yeah, sure, the guitar's fine, whatever," you know. And then I think later in high school, I found out about Duke Ellington and Charles Mingus, and so right. then I was interested in jazz composition more than classical music, and so I tried to study jazz in college. And cool. uh, as the Dave Van Ronk saying goes, I wanted to play jazz in the worst way, and I succeeded. <laughs> so uh, nice. that's kind of how I how I got into playing. Nice. And then did you, did that naturally evolve into getting a band together or starting to play live or? Uh, you know, I was too dumb to think about being a rock star or having a career like that. The first professional experience I had was, I guess, I gave a few lessons and through a variety of odd circumstances involving being in New York and being a temp and yeah. uh, things like that was I gave a couple lessons to Freddie Johnston when he was just getting started in New York. and. Oh. After a couple of lessons, you know, the singer-songwriter, and after a couple of lessons, he was like, it would be more efficient for me to hire you to play guitar in my band and try to learn how to do what you're doing. Right. So so I started playing with, that was the first sort of like <clears throat> project I was involved in that went, that went anywhere. And with my unerring nose for commercialism, uh, I quit after a year because I became interested in playing bluegrass dobro. <laughs> so I, I played on his. I played, played on Freddie's first record, which was a couple records before the big one that he yeah. made with my reputation and all that. Okay. But that was my first experience being a sideman and being around like pop and singer songwriter stuff. Then the segue into making music for media or TV and film. How did how did that happen, and how did you sort of go from that point to to there? Yeah, well, ironically, again, like I, I left New York. I lived in New York City for fourteen years where there's tons of that and the closest I got to it was I did some I did sessions once in a while for people who were composing for that kind of thing um, but I moved to Austin before I really began working as a composer and I had been here for three or four years when uh, first uh, uh, there was I was doing some sessions for uh, an engineer here in Austin and um, she was uh, her name was Gina Fant and she was developing remote session software and she wanted people to be trying it out. So uh, she offered to show me the basics of Pro Tools so that I could be one of her beta testers, which was an incredibly generous offer. I didn't know anything about, about Pro Tools, but the Mbox had just come out. So she taught me that. And then shortly after that, I had a student, a guitar student, who was involved in advertising on the creative end. He was, a, he was part of a you know, creative team. Uh, <clears throat> so he got me involved in uh, working on a 
music for a, a Krispy Kreme jingle, the radio spot. And through that, I <clears throat> became involved with a music. There's one. There was one big music house here in Austin at the time called Tequila Mockingbird. <clears throat> and ironically, that's actually the building that I have my studio in now. Oh, wow, that's. Uh, that's I'm sitting. I'm sitting. The booth that I showed you before we got on with this interview is the booth where I, I sang on the jingle that was my very first commercial <laughs> gig. I, I got to do background vocals on on my own spot. Wow. On my, on my own track. So, so uh, Brian looped me in on on this demo process where a bunch of people were writing demos for this j- crispy thing, and and I had one of the winning jingles. So. Um, that was that was my first. That was that was the second or third thing I'd worked on, and it was the first thing that I won, which was tremendous. I thought, oh well, I guess I can do that. You know? right. Um, right. And my my mo in, throughout my entire uh, music career has always been, if they let me do it once, surely I can do it again. Right. Uh, so I came in the next week to talk to one of the two partners of the music house, and I was like, that was fun. How do I do more of that? And they're like, well, uh, there's a long line, <laughs> um, but maybe you want to go. Uh, and there's some music houses in Dallas you could try. You know, maybe they need somebody. So, uh, you know, I now this is coming from New York City, where like nobody has time to do anything, and if you don't get to the point, like right. forget it. But in Texas, if you don't sit and chat for half an hour, huh. then you're 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 a rude Yankee who doesn't have time for the. The simple pleasures of life, you know, you're being, you're like getting to the point is, is to, you know, what's your problem? Like we're here to chat. Like why do you have to like, you know, it's it's rude almost to bring up the work part too soon. Right. So I had this long chat uh, here at Tequila Mockingbird, and then I, I then I called up these music houses in in Dallas, and to my astonishment, they were like, yeah, sure, you can talk to so and so. Like, when do you want to come in? I was like, really? So I went and I was going up to Fort Worth to play a gig with a band I was in at the time. And so, so, so I, these were David. These were a cold calls then. Yeah, they were. Yeah, which I mean, I was. T- I mean, my, my hands were shaking. I was standing by the phone. My wife was like, "Just call him." And I was like, ah. "You know." And yeah, I called up and I got some receptionist person and I said, "You know, I need to talk. You know, is John? Can I can I make an appointment to come in and see John?" And they were like, "Yeah, when's good?" Right. Wow. I, I was shocked. You know, and the same thing. I went in and I met both these guys, these two different music houses, and um, both cases they were like, "Yeah, come on in." We sat, we sat in their studio. I talked to them for half an hour. One of the guys I found out, like, you know, we both had young kids. We had the same birthday. We like this kind of band. I was like, it was it was, I, it was nothing like, I, like nothing I'd ever experienced uh, yeah. as far as trying to get to know people work wise, where I felt like they had something I really wanted to get next to. Yeah. You know? Wow, that's that's very very cool. And then. You ended up working. So how did that? So where did it go from there? So you ended up doing work for these guys. I weirdly, yes. Yeah, so I left a reel with both of them, and it was the most pretend reel. You know, it had my Krispy Kreme spot basically, and then it had nine other things. There were just pieces of music I'd written in my studio, and my my studio at the time was you know our garage, which we had you know built out with you know you know like walls and, and ventilation, and my studio was a laptop, an M box, a pod. Uh, and an wow. AT4033 microphone yeah. and a sixty dollars set of computer speakers with a subwoofer. Wow! You know, that, that was my that was my my studio, you know. And I had a couple of I had a couple soft. I think I had like I think I had stylus and uh, atmosphere, maybe maybe trillion. Like I had like the Spectrosonic stuff, and that was it. That's all I had. Um, huh. And I made I had made these tracks with that, and, I, and you know some instruments that I knew how to play. Uh, so that was my reel. It was one real track and nine fake ones. Um, right. But they, those two guys listened to my stuff, and one of them called me about a month later and said, "Yeah, this track is it available? Because from my reel, you know, this piece I had written." And he ended up putting it on a Comcast spot, uh, which uh, you know that never happens. And then the other guy um, at the other music house, they ended up getting, um, they ended up making a, a deal with First Com, the, the library company. To make, I think, like a dozen libraries that year, and so he called and subcontracted one of them to me. He wanted a bunch of just solo acoustic or duet or trio acoustic guitar pieces. Because mm-hmm. he listened to my reel and it was like, I see where you're coming from. You're kind of this guy, and I was like, No, I can do everything, like every new composer is. Right, right. But he called me for the thing that it was obvious that I was the best at, which was playing the guitar. Um, and it took me like ten years to come full circle on that and realize, like, no, it's good to be. A, a specialist at something. It's good to be the guy they call for this because they won't call you for everything. 
Right. They have someone who's great at orchestration. They have someone who's great at writing, you know, like, I don't know, like Henry Mancini, James Bond, whatever. Not that Mancini did James Bond, you know, but like they have someone who's really great at period stuff. They have someone who's really great at hip hop. They have someone who's great, like, like you know, super contemporary synth, whatever. Yeah. You know, if you're the guy who's great at, you know, playing acoustic instruments, then, you know, not every spot calls for, you know, those things. But when they have, Anything that's remotely in that wheelhouse, I get called for banjo, I get called for pedal steel, I get called for nylon string. Like, you know, I'm not the best at any of those things, but they have in their head, like, if it's Rootsy, you know, you're the guy. Not, yeah. You know, like, one or, you know, a, a couple of people have that thing. That they, yeah. 